Welcome back, everybody, to Let's Talk Toku. Our guest today is Jason Narvi. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry, vodka. Hi. How you doing, Squall? Good. How about yourself, Jason? I'm good, man. Yeah. I was going to do it with the hot copy, but, you know, it's, we'd have to be getting hazard pay for that. No, we. Uh, that's actually funny because in a previous episode, we had a spit take where I just kept doing it every time my guest would say something. <laughs> So it's a it's a reoccurring gag here. On Let's Let's say, yeah, that's a dangerous thing to do for uh, when you're working on computers as you're filming. You know, just it's <laughs> hilarious till you blow out you know four thousand dollars worth of equipment. <laughs> oh, that's gonna cost me. I like living dangerously. <laughs> awesome. We have uh, Jason Narvi here today to talk about Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but we can obviously go beyond that because right there's so much more to it than just the first seasons, but. Obviously, the first seasons were so impactful, so influential, so groundbreaking, um, and you were a major part of that success when it sort of kicked off. I was the only reason for the success when it kicked off, I mean, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just, uh, <laughs> let's just jump into this. Let's uh, talk about like your background, like before Power Rangers, what sort of led to um, the audition, because like you talk to any other sort of ranger actor, anybody on the show, the audition process is so strenuous now. Like there's so many steps to it. Um, yeah. And I was wondering if it was different when it started. Yeah, okay, so was it different? Yes, it wasn't quite as many steps, but they still had a pretty comprehensive um, search. Um, and it's funny because I originally was in on that search and then out and then they went away and I came back to it. Let me, let me simplify it. So um, early on, I had gotten an audition um, that was basically a cattle call for some kind of nerdy uh, figure uh, for a show called Phantoms. I probably still have the facts because back then, it was the stone age. You'd go to your agent, your agent would be a dinosaur, you know, uh, 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 for the TV uh, show audition, audition. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they'd send, they'd send the, the, the breakdown. So I got a fax that said, Hey, you have, you have a cattle call for this show called phantoms. It's a nerdy guy. I don't recall if they had said it was sci-fi or superhero. I don't know if they knew. Um, so I went there and it was one of those that where they just have a camera standing up and you try to look as nerdy as possible. And there's 30 guys in there that look all nerdy and you go, hi, my name is Jason Arve. I'm with Kellen Arletta. Thank you. God, oh man, I did it. I nailed that one. You know, and of course I didn't nail that one. <laughs> um, so what that was actually is that was them doing the very first cattle call audition for Power Rangers. Okay. And uh, as you could probably guess from the character title, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot. What character do you think? Nerdy character, action, mm. sci-fi that, hero. That's got to be Trini. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I auditioned for treating like, lady, you got a shade, you know. <laughs> but so, you, uh, you auditioned for Billy. It sounds like that's exactly it. That was the audition for Billy. And so obviously they took my my, you know, they took my picture and they threw it away. And they ended up going with David Yost. You know what I'm saying? Like he <laughs> looks something like out of 902 and 0, which was a big deal at that time. You know, he's chiseled and good looking, and he had the qua. And they had to work really hard in those early episodes to try to make him look like a geek. So if you look at him in the uh, actual pilot, which not a lot of people have seen, but I think Shout Factory uh, put on one of their their box sets. Um, like his hair is like all like, <laughs> I'm a geek, but I'm good looking. You know, like, like I don't know why they went with him. He's like gorgeous. You know, I'm like, come on, give an ugly brother a break. Uh, but they didn't. So what they did was they cast uh, a stunt man, and I think Paulie was even kind of doing a, doing stunts on that because Paulie, as he, he had done a little bit of stunt work actually, um, and Paulie had actually done some uh, stunt work for Louis, uh, and he for a bunch of for some sports uh, commercials, so sports uh, uh, store commercials, he had done some 
uh, stunt work. Uh, but so the characters were named like Punk 1, 2, and 3, and Pauly was Punk 3. Punk 1 was a guy named Bobby. Uh, and he had all the lines of the leader of the gang of punks at this bowling alley, right? Mm -hmm. And Billy, I mean, uh, Bobby was a big guy. He was a stunt guy, you know, so he was kind of really menacing. And that early Power Ranger thing, it was really um, your, your bullies slash criminals <laughs> fighting against, you know, these high school kids who just want to have a good old American time and go bowling. You know, what is this, the Flintstones? But that being said, uh, so they used that, and that was the actual pilot, you know, somewhat low budget. And that pilot was never meant to be, re be seen by anyone except for, um, like, Fox, you know, whomever wanted to pick up the show. Mm -hmm. So once they did it, um, uh, Paulie had gotten in tight with uh, Tony Oliver because they had similar backgrounds in theater. Right. Mm -hmm. And Paulie was a good actor. Bobby was fine, but he was he was again, he was a stunt guy. And they thought, oh, we have to tone it down a little bit more. You know, heroes punching people in the face and kicking them in the nards is probably not good, wholesome family entertainment for the kids. So they flipped him. So Paulie became the leader and Bobby became the follower. So obviously, uh, punks one and three became Bulk and Skull. Right. <laughs> But Bobby was not a great sidekick. He was not necessarily funny, and he looked more frightening than the leader. So what they did is they went back. So the, the, in the interim, the show had been picked up by Fox. The, the set, they had a soundstage. The set, the production crew, everyone was ready to go. This was like, who on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. The following Monday, they were going to start – principal photography on the season. So that'll tell you how close it was. We are like, for instance, we're shooting this now on a Monday, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if they were going to start shooting this Friday. That's about how close they were. Wow. So, so my, so at that point, my audition process was they literally went through the pile of rejects, all pun intended. And I was a dumpster. Exactly. <laughs> they were going through the dumpster. <laughs> that, gives a, that gives the first title day of the dumpster, a new meaning. That's the only reason, again, it, it all comes back to me, right? right. It was originally exactly. called The Heroes Arise, and then they're like, you know, we really like this Narvi guy, and we found him in a dumpster. So we either call him Hook Nose Dumpster Dude or Day of the Dumpster. You know, that way it's a double thing. So they went through it, and out of the pile of rejects, they picked people that look ugly, stupid, ridiculous. I don't know. Uh, and I was one of those people. And so they had me go in and for my audition, they had sides that they faxed me. I was working uh, in a parts uh, department at a Ford dealership, uh, Lincoln, Ford Lincoln Mercury dealership. And they sent me the sides and they weren't even complete. So they asked me to improvise. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, meanwhile, I show up just coming from a place where I was, you know, hauling, you know, transmission parts. So I didn't even dress up for the part. I just throw my leather jacket and went. I was greasy. <laughs> Showered. There's the book of the show. Exactly. It was <laughs> how the hell did I know that was perfect? And I also decided I was going to have them remember me, whether they they liked me or not. Like I was going to be an obnoxious little prick, and that's what I did. So that was my audition. Was in a boardroom. They're like, um, "Can you improvise this a little bit? Like maybe flirt with Ellen, our producer." I'm like. So I'm doing some chords. So I drank their sodas and I trashed the office, you know, and all that stuff. I'm like, these motherfuckers are going to not like me. So literally, I remember, I remember, oh God, talking about a me too moment for this poor producer. I remember taking Ellen and like rubbing her, fi my, my fingers in on her, on her uh, earlobes. Like, hey baby, how you doing? Real skeezy stuff. I'm like, they're going to hate me. I'll never get this part and I'll deserve it. Um, and I'm like, hey baby, how you doing? And then they're like, hey, how do you feel about slapstick comedy? I'm like, that's, I'm like, that's insulting. I'm an actor. I'm a Shakespearean actor. So I opened the door to the office to get the hell out of there. And I, I opened it intentionally so it would be bam and smack me right in the face. Bam. And I fell over their desk backwards, <laughs> their papers and their sides everywhere. I'm like, Psh! you know, as the papers are settling. Yeah. I'm like, thanks. And then I left. Um, and of course, I didn't realize that's exactly what they wanted. So, um, so they called me in immediately for a callback. So the next day I went in for a callback. Um, and that's when they took me to the sound stage and they're like, we need to team me up with a guy that you're going to be working with. If you get this part, mm -hmm. I don't know who else had gone for that callback. Um, 
I think Polly said there was maybe one other person on the callback. I forget actually, but I went and like Polly was already in makeup. He, I mean, uh, in wardrobe. So I show up on the set. They're like, and they put me on one side of the set, you know. So imagine I'm like, I'm way, you know. Uh-huh. And they're like, we're gonna go get this other guy, <laughs> you know. And there's me waiting there, like, you know. And they go way to the other side of the set. I don't know why they just don't take me over. And like, hey, here's the guy. And they brought him over, and as Paulie's walking over, I get a chance to size him up, you know, because anytime you go into an audition, you size up people. Usually, you look at them like, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, I'll kill him. He looks like me, he looks like me, he looks like me. So I have to kill him, 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 and him. I just want to kill him because there's something wrong in my past. Um, so, that, so as Paulie's coming up to me, I'm looking at him, and I don't realize he's in wardrobe. And I'm looking at him like, what a prick. What, who the hell? Wow, God, I'm going to hate this guy. Look at him. Just look at him. Look at him! Leather jacket with a freaking vest over <laughs> over it, long hair. He didn't have it up in the ponytail, I don't think. You know, I'm like, I don't oh, I don't like this guy. And he walks up to me and he looks at me and goes, Hi, I'm Paulie. You know. It was instant warmth and it was instant chemistry. It's like, hey man, how you doing? Okay, good. Um, so uh, we're gonna have to work some stuff. So let's uh, let's let's play around. And literally, we start that instantly started speaking my language of impro- improvisation. Paulie had a background in theater. I had a background in theater. So we click instantly and started. The first thing we started doing was not even talking. We pretty much started playing almost instantly. We took that little script they had and we built it into something big. Look, Bulk and Skull were only in five episodes, Mm -hmm. the entire season. Uh, And Paulie and I knew that we were um, (laughs) replaceable, not important. And we decided we were gonna make our, we were gonna make the biggest out of this tiny moment that we had. Mm -hmm. Um, And what we didn't realize is that, and Saban didn't even realize that's exactly what they needed. You know, Um, so that language of improvisation uh, even on that first day, as we were playing, we were not even in front of the cameras. It wasn't even time for the executives to look at us yet. They just let us kind of go. Mm-hmm. Almost like, hey kids, I'm dropping off in the sitters, you guys go play. Um, at some point, we turned around and we saw all the suits kind of watching us work together. Um, and that's when we're, and Paulie's like, I think you got this part now, because they're watching you. Um, so that was it, that was the audition process. And that that moment never, did not let up till what, this moment now. That's still the language we speak. Improvise, screw around, throw them something because we could be replaced at any minute. So that's the long version of my audition story. There's so many steps that are involved, like to somebody who has never auditioned, to somebody who wants to like audition for Power Rangers. There's always so many steps in a lot of productions because there's so many people that have say, there's so many people that have stake, there's so many people that just have all these different ideas and it's until they see you with that other person, they're not sure if they're gonna make the right decision. Yeah, you're right, you, and you nailed it on the head with that other person. You know, um, and this is one of the hardest things for for young actors to really wrap their heads around. It's not you; it's your chemistry with somebody else. I mean, you are part of the puzzle. If you if you're terrible, <laughs> they're not going to look at you. But it's how good you are with somebody else. Um, it wasn't until very recently, for instance, that I saw um, Austin and uh, uh, Walt's audition tape uh, together when they were in the room together. Mm-hmm. Walt made Austin better, or Austin made Walt better. Either way, um, they were great together on screen, you know? Um, and that must have been like the fourth part of their audition, you know? The, the cattle call, hi, how are you? My name is so-and-so. And then you leave without saying lines. That's the first part, which is a bunch of, um, you know, producers in chimps in suits going, you know, <laughs> Oh, that means that chimpanzee likes him. We should we should look at him again. Let's see if you can actually speak. So then you have the, do you fit the type they're looking for? And then you have the, you know, the part where you actually try the dialogue. Are you good enough? And then it's, let's test it out with somebody else. And then let's do it with something else, you know? Um, and often producers, when they're starting a, a show, they don't yet know what they want either. And it's an actor's job to show them what they don't know. Like they think they do. Again, David, we want a nerd. They end up with David. 
right? So it, it's your job to show them what they don't know, you know? Um, that's an actor's job. This is why it's fun. Watch a show sometime. Uh, watch a Sopranos. Watch, you know, any of the big shows that I've ever been out. The first few episodes really are great. It's It takes about five or ten episodes for them to really figure out those characters. And then they're like, oh, look at that, you know. Take that five steps before, and there's your audition process. Mm-hmm. You know? It's funny. I'd, um, have you seen the, the newest Power Ranger movie, the 2017 one? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, uh, the cast that they have was super like, um, they're, they're like, think of the TV versions, but like a thousand times, you know, like more refined in a way. Um, yeah. So it was really, I was a part of that audition process. I remember like going to a few of the things they had, like their finals up in like Vancouver, I believe. Um, and on the, like the Blu-ray special features, they had all of these sort of like you said, like meet and greets where like they would put five of them together and they would all have them stand together and they would all look to the left. They'd all look to the right. And then they all like do an action pose. And they did that with like a hundred people. Yeah, absolutely. Imagine. Okay. So imagine what that process I told you about just uh, pairing up me and Mm Polly. Imagine when you got every single show, five helmet heads, five actors that you need to really pair up and get you guys to all love each other and get along and balance each other out. That's a hell of a undertaking. Yeah. But you do with, with that power ranger movie, they notice how all the power rangers are quirky outcasts. They're all bulk and skull now, aren't they? Yeah. So it's taken Saban or Fox or whomever uh, produced the movie. It's taken them 30 years to come around to it. Hasn't it? They're like, Oh, Oh, that's what we need. We need heroes that are not the big heroes of the school, right? Yeah, right? they're all in detention. So yeah, dude, come on. They're all ugh, I hate being right twenty years ago. <laughs> all right, don't go nowhere. We'll be right back with some more. Let's talk Toku. I won't. I'll be stuck in a cage. You're putting me in a cage. I can't go anywhere. Uh, we we weren't supposed to talk about that. <laughs> Help me! I'm being held against my will. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to Let's Talk Toku. If you're just joining us, we are here today with Jason Narvi. <laughs> you know, the best part of Power Rangers, Mighty Morphin. Uh, half of Bulk and Skull. It's the great. Half of Bulk and Skull. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe like a third of Bulk and Skull. <laughs> a third? Oh, yeah. Okay. Polly was a little bit bigger, yeah. The and. <laughs> the and is, is what? Is that, that, that's our chi, is what that, that and it's is. The third. <laughs> Uh, so we were talking a little bit about how you got into Power Rangers, how that sort of audition process happened and how just unique and outcast every sort of ranger is today, especially like by the movie standards and just sort of the legacy of Bulk and Skull. Um, and to that, the TV shows are still very much like I'm the perfect son. I'm the perfect cheerleader. Um, etc. But they always have these bulk and skull type characters like Beast Morphers that's on right now has these two characters named Ben and Betty okay. which are just like the yeah. slapstick <laughs> fart humor um, yeah, yeah. lackeys. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the newer seasons that have those type of characters like last season in Ninja Steel they had uh, Victor and Monty. Oh yeah. I do. Okay yes I do know. I do know Victor and Monty. Yeah yeah. They did good work I, I thought. Yeah they're you know, I mean, Okay, so the great irony is now I've got kids, okay? They're really small. They're four and six. So I guess they're not as small as they were, which ironically means I don't watch a lot of stuff. I don't have time. And if the TV is on, which is we try to keep it a rare thing, like that means they're occupied. I'm going elsewhere to do something else, you know? So that's the irony. I haven't seen the new Power Ranger movie because going to the movies, it's like if we have, like my kids were too small to sit in a movie theater when it came out. And if we were gonna go out on a date, it wasn't gonna be to go see a Power Ranger movie. You know, nothing wrong with a Power Ranger movie. It's just, you know, hey baby, let's spend some time together. Let's watch my franchise. You know, that's a hard sell. 
This goes back again to the original when they're figuring out what Power Rangers was supposed to be. So the first thing was they thought it would be fun if the Power Rangers did um, their own, uh, did the slapstick. If the Power Rangers were trying to morph and they're all falling. Oh, I've blown up. I can't really morph right now. Um, so they, and it just didn't work. They, this is an old model for superheroes. They must be perfect. And if they're perfect, they have to be perfect in the other world. I mean, Clark Kent was still a good guy. He was even nicer and better than Superman, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bruce Wayne was even darker and had a worse backstory than Batman, his alter ego. So this idea of what a superhero should be in their alter ego hadn't shifted over to this, I guess what we'd say, the kind of Marvel archetype, right? Mm -hmm. They are outsiders and their superpowers are a burden as much as they are a blessing in some ways, okay? But that being said, we'll, we'll go back to Power Rangers. So what happened with the Power Rangers is it wasn't working. Watch some of those early episodes and you'll see how they try to be, ah, oh, weird. And the Power Rangers are all winners. They're the guys in high school, guys and girls in high school, um, that were the popular kids that never had problems that everyone would have liked. And back in the 90s, I think producers were afraid to show anything else because they thought, <gasps> They're role models. We don't want to show role models that have problems. I don't know why. Like, are kids going to go out and intentionally have problems and be bullied and not fit in? Are they going to do that intentionally because they think that's cool? Um, so, but they came out with the kids that basically, if you were not a jock, uh, a gymnast, um, super popular on campus, those are the people that probably bullied you. <laughs> So now we have Vulcan Skull come in who are supposed to be the bullies and the baddies. And really, we're the only nonconformists there are. Okay? We're the only people that have our own real backstory and can be flawed. So if you go back now, the way the Power Rangers laugh at us, you're like, they're body shaming bulk, aren't they? Oh, they're marginalizing Skull, aren't they? It's the truth. So that's why I think the new Ranger movie decided, you know what? Kids want to see you know, young people want to see other people struggle too and overcome your struggles. That's, look, man, that is the textbook definition of be, being a real life hero is overcoming difficulties, you know? Um, it's not about being John Wayne and killing all the bad guys because if you were big and tough like John Wayne so, supposedly was, that's easy. Um, I always like to say it's like being J Jimmy Stewart. You know, Jimmy Stewart was, you know, kind of everybody is a little bit awkward and, you know, he wasn't as physically intimidating as John Wayne. And so when something came at him, he could get hurt. John Wayne could never get hurt, you know? I was working, uh, I, this is a bit of a paradigm shift, but a few years ago I started working with the USS Indianapolis Survivors Reunion. And the Indianapolis was a World War II battle cruiser that got sunk at the very end of the war. And those men were in the water for four days about, you know, better part, some a little bit less, some a little bit more. Um, and I had to give a speech uh, because I had portrayed the man who was their captain. And he ended up, unfortunately, taking his own life because he couldn't deal with the guilt of it. And this is when I came to the realization that, look, man, the reason these men were heroes was not because they were born heroes, but because they were people like you and me who had to do the right thing at a particular moment in history. Not that they wanted to, but they felt they felt they had to. And they were fragile and they got their butts whooped and they survived and they did the right thing at the end of the day. And it was hard. And doing the hard thing is what makes heroes. Mm -hmm. Not doing the easy thing that comes second nature. Sort of lighten it back up. Going back to the Power Rangers, if the tough athletic kids could be heroes, who cares? You know, who cares? I actually call that term John McClaning. When you mm. rise to the power that you uh, you need to save the day, you need to act. Otherwise, worse things are going to happen with yeah without it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And look, man, even dramatically speaking, if we don't know that you can win the day, it's more interesting to watch now, isn't it? You know, and I, Superman, come on. You know, what can you do to Superman? Kryptonite, okay. Other than that, come on. He's going to win. Going back to Power Rangers, um, you shot, I want to say, what, six seasons, two movies? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, yeah. not like that, not like that. It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was more seasons than that because um, – the way uh, our seasons ran were a little bit more fluid mm -hmm. back then. 
Well, even now, not a lot of shows were doing as many episodes as we did. So we would shoot a season and like season one was 40 episodes, wow. right? Yeah. And then they asked us to come back around Christmas and shoot another 20, which was still season one. That was 60 episodes for season one ish. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. Our, our seasons were a little bit fluid. So on some things I see that I did six seasons, some I see I did seven, some I did eight. I'm like, I, I don't know about that. You know, I think they, uh, they split it up mighty Morphin uh, in post and when they were releasing it, uh, well, which makes Mighty Morphin because there was like 80 episodes of Mighty Morphin and then 40 of of Zio. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so, it bleeds together. Because you've got to remember back then we also were not going to clean house every single season. We were going to stick with the one formula. First of all, I don't know that anyone thought it would get more than a season or two. Like, you know, getting picked up was like, we got we have jobs next year. Um and then when they went to Zio and they decided to clean house, that was a real nail biter, actually, you know, uh, with the actors. And I think it's safe to say the producers as well. Um, and this was a very shrewd move. They had to take a chance. And I think the chance was, look, at some point, people will get tired of the same property. So we need to change it up. So we're going to change the costumes. Um they didn't change out all the actors at first either. But then they said, what, once the original cast decides to leave, and it, it, by and large, it was this kind of agreement with Hyam that everyone could decide when they wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. I know there was, there was some contract stuff with um, three of the Rangers, but that's a different story. Um, he wasn't gonna force anybody out, but after we switched over to Zio, that was the plan was every season they would completely clean house and new actors would come through. Except for Bulk and Skull, but you know. Yeah. So yeah, so that was a huge gamble. That was a huge gamble to do that. You know, so really Mighty Morphin really extends more than just a season and then an extended season and then into the second season. You know, the second season still started as Mighty Morphin, you know. Jason, I want to ask, uh, what all do you know about Tokusatsu? Like, obviously, this show is called Let's Talk Toku. Let's talk. What is Tokusatsu to you? When did you first find out that the show that you were making was originally a very successful Japanese property? Uh, that's a good question. I think I knew it from the audition okay. that it was a well-known Japanese property. And it's so funny. Toku was one of those strange things that, look, uh, it was always there and you knew about it and it would creep into pop culture here and there, but there was no sort of Mayflower of Toku in those early days, okay? Um, growing up in the 80s, it was an interesting time because Toku was coming in and it was being embraced in a way that it wasn't in the 70s, I think, you know, from what I remember of the 70s, for crying out loud, you know. Um, but but the eight, you got to remember that the 80s was all about quirky and weird, right? It was all about things that are quirky and strange and weird. So when you had suddenly these um, like pop culture stores that were popping up, these kind of uh, precursors of what is hot topic, you know, or you'd go to the cool, strange neighborhoods, you know, where you would get, uh, you know, punk rock uh, t-shirts and, you know, uh, accessories, bondage gear, like Melrose down on in LA, you would see Toku products there, posters, uh, toys, um, Godzilla, because it was weird and quirky and strange and therefore cool, but it wasn't quite here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So everyone knew Godzilla. You grow up knowing Godzilla. If you're a little kid that liked dinosaurs in the 70s, there was no shows with dinosaurs. You had Land of the Lost, which was mainly sleaze stacks where a bunch of lizard looking dudes that have asthma. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, sir, could you please get out of our jungle? I'm a sleaze stack. Um, but it still was not a dinosaur show. So if you really wanted a dinosaur, the closest thing you had was Godzilla right? It was these old Godzilla movies, you know? 
And those are the kind of thing that you can't turn away from. So when Power Rangers first came came up, it was, wait a minute, it's a Godzilla movie. Wait a minute, it's sort of like Voltron, which is not really Toku, but based on Toku. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sort of looks like those Japanese shows we've heard about, but have never actually seen. Okay, so it wasn't until about the middle of filming the first season of Power Rangers that I actually saw the, the full pilot and actually saw any of the toku footage um and frankly i had not seen a full episode of zuranja which is what mighty morphin was based on what we had instead was a bunch of these thick volumes of these kind of bibles of toku and they were all in japanese kind of like that poster right behind you so it's not like we could read them but we could see what was going on in those and we would have to kind of figure out what their stories were and they were a little more adult um, a little darker, you know, there's one that's got Power Rangers, uh, uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, you know, the Zurangers, uh, Zurangers, uh, sorry, that, that's the proper way to say it, Zurangers, uh. Yeah, you don't want anybody, like, making a comment later. No, 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 no. I get no. that all the time on my channel. <laughs> yeah, Zurangers, uh. Um, you, you have them, like, tied to stakes, or somewhat yeah, cru- crucified, yeah. You're like... Oh my God, you can't do that. That, oh my God, that's dark. And then you find out the Green Ranger like killed his family. You're like, oh my God, that's dark. Um, but their backstory was kind of cool too. Cause if you look at um, that particular uh, series, the Zhu um, they had their costumes were like semi medieval looking. And again, in the book, cause that's all we have is these picture books. Um, there's like the Bible the on-camera Bible of that show that in that show they would seem to refer back to that would have like hieroglyphics that showed like Egyptian soldiers, you know, with, hang on. Ah, I need props for this. <laughs> like they'd be like on the back of a dinosaur. Again, hieroglyphics, you know, uh-huh. back of a dinosaur with a sword. And you're like, the hell is that? You know, dinos- what? So there's a whole mythos in that, you know, in that the Japanese shows had that we didn't. Mm-hmm. And that was our, my first clue that actually it's more than just Godzilla. It's more than just guys in suits, you know? Um, and of course, as a, as a kid, as a kid, when Voltron first came out, okay, Voltron was a cartoon, yes. But, but like I said, it, it was based on the Sentai franchise, it seems. I could be wrong about that. So it was based on the, the Super, you know, the Sentai, which is live action. But the thing that seemed to trickle in was the toys. If you went to the swap meet, you could get these Japanese toys that were like, that were better than Transformers, right? Because they could transform and then they transform into something else and then they were something else. But yeah, so Toko, I mean, Toko's always been there, you know, and, and it was strange too. Uh, this is a little side personal note about Toku and Power Rangers coming up in the 90s. You know, um, they were trying to reboot Ultraman here in the, in the States. Um, I don't know how far it got. And I know they had tried to Americanize Godzilla and even Ultraman, which we don't think about many times. Ironically, when we started working on Power Rangers, my sister, who worked in film um, in the art department at the time, um, she was working on Ultraman. And Harold, who played uh, 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 Principal Kaplan, Mr. Kaplan in Power Rangers, he worked on, on the Ultraman show with her. Like he was one of the actors on that show. So she was working on her toku as I was working on my toku. And it was still this thing that most of the world didn't know about. But they, were, they knew there was this sense that, man, this type of sci-fi superhero live action show would work in the state. So we knew it would work. And we knew that, that the time was ripe to bring Eastern pop culture over to the West as opposed to us going over there and always assimilating it. So they were trying, it's very interesting. And now it's kind of second nature that, of course, everyone knows um, uh, Toku. Everyone knows Japanese pop culture now, which is, it's kind of cool to actually see, to see that wave coming this direction now too.
We had a guy named Matt Frank that was on who is an illustrator for Godzilla. Like he is the Godzilla. Ah. He was talking about like growing up in the 80s and 90s. He like was a freak about dinosaurs, but there was no dinosaurs. Yeah. There was no dinosaurs, anything. And then Power Rangers came out and he was like, yes, you know. Right? Power Rangers is everything that kids love. Robots, dinosaurs, superheroes. And and the great thing about Power Rangers, we forget about this too, that Power Rangers is really the first live action, uh, uh, you know, superhero show, kind of. I mean, there was Superman and there was Batman, you know. Successful but, but, one, I should say. Like, overly huge. Like, obviously, like, you had, like, the Supermans in, like, the 50s right. and 60s. You had the Batmans, obviously. Um, but, like, those single heroes are really good because they're they're pop icon, you know, from the comics from all that time before. But Power Rangers came out of nowhere, and it was... It was, it was created for TV. I mean, that's the whole thing. It was created for TV. Um, and it was also the first kind of multi racial cast. I mean, that was one of the things that we, uh, obviously people make fun of the fact that the black ranger was black and the yellow ranger was yellow. And um, at, at one point, w one of the red rangers turns out to be part native American, I think. Right. And you're like, Oh, but no. Okay. So they, they always claim Saban always claims, you know, Saban Hayam is not from the United States. You know, he's Israeli Egyptian. Uh, a lot of his partners were Israeli and they said, well, you know, we don't look at race in the same way. Um, that being said, whatever missteps were made in coloring the costumes, you had an Asian superhero, female, two strong females, okay, that were great characters. You had a strong African-American superhero. And again, I cannot for the life of me think of another live action African-American superhero that came before Walt. So I think that is a huge legacy to have that people underplay. And it's good that we can take that for granted now. It's good that we move to a point where superheroes don't have to be, you know, white all the time. But I think Power Rangers had a big thing to do with it. And there is no coincidence either that as Westerners, we're snobs, we're colonialists. We think what we have is the best and the world wants to follow in our footsteps. So now we have an Asian superhero team that we are taking on in America. So we are being influenced by that story and we're able to, to show an America that looks more like the way America really is, which is not purely Caucasian white bread, you know? That's a big deal. That's a huge deal, actually, you know? You wouldn't have Miles Morales without Walt. I'm sorry. No, I, I think that's a really good uh, point, and one of the reasons why the show was so successful, because I was born in 1992, and that was right when... Oh! I gotta shoot you just for saying that, making me feel old like, ah! Do you, you hear that? You hear that? snap that's my hit <laughs> but <laughs> I, I like i was the target demographic like i grew up like power Rangers has always been in my life like i remember watching the reruns of mighty morphin i remember watching it like i believe my first season was turbo or in space like i just remember everything around it and it was always just something that all the kids were really excited about where other properties you know, maybe just the boys were excited about Sailor Moon came out. All the girls were in love with that because it was targeted for them. But Power Rangers was always this inclusive thing that anybody could be a ranger. Anybody, you know, of any background, of any gender, of any sort of walk of life. And I think even even like Super Sentai, which is still going on in its 44th season this year. Yeah. Yeah. They the last season, the one that's coming over as Power Rangers now still only had one girl on the team. Like, you look at how far we've come, how we were doing this back in the 90s, and how even Japan is still kind of behind in the times. Like, it's not as inclusive. You know what I mean? Well, let's, so here's one of the things. I've given this a lot of thought over the years, and especially because the world has changed and the real-life dangers have changed, okay, since Power Rangers first aired. And... There's a difference, and let's be careful about this. There's a world of difference between dark and nuanced. I think when, for instance, the first Tim Burton Batman came out, we confused those two. We liked Batman because he was dark. Well, now that we live in a world where people 
really do believe that they are these bad guys. And when we start humanizing these bad guys to the point that we have people that imitate them and they are the way in which we understand negative psychology. We, we forget that actually the reason we liked the original Batman, yes, it was dark in color, like it was black leather and it looked cool, big pointy ears on Batman instead of those little nubby things. It was one of the first superheroes that was nuanced, okay? Power Rangers is interesting because, and I've learned this from meeting the fans, and it really does come from meeting these fans. It is not dark. It is still light. It gets a little bit dark. It shows you that there's dark things out there, but it doesn't show them. It acknowledges, I'm talking about the original Super Sentai, it acknowledges that there is darkness and there's bad things and people do get killed out there, but it's not showing them in graphic ways. They're hyper-realistic. And at the end of the day, things always get better. What the American version did was it showed that there's people of all types out there and that superheroes are regular people out there that have problems. And at the end of the day, they can overcome them. That's tiny nuance. And it's appropriate for kids to see that nuance. The kind of nuance that we see in like the Joker is dark and disturbing even for adults. I no longer celebrate that darkness in superhero films. I think it's, it's, too, it's adult, but it's so real now, it's no longer fantasy. We can't escape it, and therefore it's not fun. It's, I, I don't care for it anymore. You know, Power Rangers can still stay fun, and that's what kids need. And therefore it ultimately gives a positive message of good and evil, but without saying that's all there is. It's there's good, there's evil, there's kids that have a hard day, there's kids that have an easy day, there are kids that are angry, there's kids that are bad, all the things that really are important to young, young, young kids. And at the end of the day, let's never forget that it was marketed for those kids who at the age of three and five are learning that they have emotions, oh my goodness. And they like to be stimulated, but they also sometimes feel sad and angry and bad. It's, look, man, I'm not trying to denigrate. It's not that far away from Mr. Rogers or even Barney the Dinosaur. How do you feel today? Those are important things. If you can't get how you're feeling today, if you don't get that right, you gotta, life is gonna be difficult. So I think this is what the, the fans really latched onto. You know, you don't have to go dark, as dark as some of those disturbing superhero rated R, PG-13 even films. But it can say, yeah, there's there's bad stuff out there, and that's part of life. But you know what? Let let's let's go to the light. Let's go to the light, and let's overcome it. There's there's a uh, there's something my uh, one of my faculty advisors on my doctor, Jody Enders, said. She says, you know, we're all the walking wounded, you know. And I think the fact that superhero movies now acknowledge that and make being a superhero not a metaphor for good and evil or justice and injustice, kind of in the old fashioned way, but rather a metaphor of overcoming your own personal difficulties. Now superhero movies really become what myths used to really be, legitimately what myths used to be, what Greek mythology, the Greek tragedies used to be about, was human frailty and what it could do to you and in the case of superhero movies, how you can overcome it, no matter who you are. You know, that's where superhero movies have also come around to, and that's, that's, that's encouraging. Anyway, Jason, that's all that we have for today on Let's Talk Toku. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm glad that I was here. It was good to be here. It was good to be had. Oh, I was so glad that you guys ah. tuned in. We will, <laughs> we'll get you on the next episode. Maybe we'll get Polly on. Uh, a future episode or if you have any other people that you could reach out to that we would have on the show i want to continue this sort of power ranger journey well i talked to a couple of people you know i'll talk off the air we, we've got some people i think that'll be coming down the pike awesome well hopefully you guys will tune in for those episodes thank you so much we will see you all on the next episode of let's talk toku 